The story about Monterey I really like. <laughs> I was living in Mill Valley, California, and I I can't remember the order exactly, but I ended up moving to the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco into a commune. What had happened, there was a another concert in Mill Valley called the Fantasy Fair, and I went to that and I met a guy next to the stage when the Doors were playing. Nobody knew who the Doors were then. He said, do you have photographs of, of the hate? And I said, oh, I got a few. I come there sometimes. He says, well, come over and show them to me. So I ended up moving into that house where he lived. And I lived on the third floor in the front of this old Victorian. And the only thing in my room was a bed. There was nothing else in there. So I never really moved in. I just sort of camped in there for a while till I moved out. <laughs> so I needed an assignment to do the, everybody had assignments, I didn't have one, and somehow I got one from a magazine called Hullabaloo, which was for teenage girls, so that I had a press pass, so I could get into Monterey. And I got there and I kind of wandered around and I, I got into the press pit, as they called it, in front of the stage. And then I went out and wandered around and I realized you couldn't leave the press pit because if you left it, you couldn't get back in. Because it, it meant after that everybody had to trade places with somebody in order to get in there. So I got in there and I just stayed. Because I had assigned myself that I needed to f take a picture of every musician. And I missed a few drummers because they were too far back on the stage and I couldn't see them. But otherwise I got them all. Monterey was first, and Monterey was where Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Laura Nero, and a bunch of other bands got introduced to the world. Nobody knew who they were before that. It was peaceful. Nobody ever did anything to hurt anybody. And it, I, that's true. That's my experience. It was really amazing. In Monterey, I went there with a woman named Abigail Folger, who was Jim Marshall's girlfriend. Jim Marshall being a well-known music photographer. My sleeping bag was stolen out of the back of Abby or Gibby's car. And that's when I thought it's a turning point. The freedom and the peace and love and leaving everybody alone is over. This is, this, this is going to be another world now. And I was right. I moved to the hate because I wanted to be near where everything was happening. And I didn't do the portraits right away. I did uh, candid, <coughs> candid photographs, photojournalism. I did photojournalism. When I was leaving, I said, I've got to do my own version of the Haight-Ashbury, and it's going to be portraiture, and I'm going to use a tripod. And I had a whole scheme and a whole plan. So I had a Hasselblad on a tripod, and I would ask somebody if I could take their portrait, and they would say yes or no. And if they said yes, I'd set the tripod up in front of them. And then uh, and I'd say, just sit naturally, take a breath, and when you exhale, I'm going to take the picture. Because I had this idea that when you, that the energy going in and out was an issue. And so an exhale was when they were letting their energy out, and that's when the picture should be made. And so that's how I did all those pictures. Nicholas von Hoffman was someone I met at a press party in San Francisco. He was working for the Washington Post, and he was doing a book on the hate, which I have a copy hmm. of. Um, <clears throat> but we sort of became friends, and I just followed him around. I went everywhere he went, and so he did all the footwork, and all I had to do was have my camera and take the pictures. That was the first year, but then he left, and <clears throat> I kept photographing and wandering in the street. I moved out of that commune into another place and another place. I just wandered the street and took candid pictures until... I realized I was leaving and I said, I've got to do something that the press hasn't done and I haven't done because nobody's telling the truth about this place and I'm going to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Not that that's possible, but that was my idea. The press created the Haight-Ashbury. 
because they wrote about it all over the country. And so thousands of young people flocked to Haight-Ashbury because they read about it in the newspaper. That's really how it happened. And I realized that the press created the Haight-Ashbury. No, I don't know if anybody else has said that, but that's what happened. I saw them as individuals, and I thought a way to show it was to do ultimately formal portraits of individuals. I'm not sure where I got the idea for the formal portraits. People might say it was Dan, Dan Arbus, but it wasn't. I knew about her, but I didn't, that wasn't where it was coming from. It was just, I thought the press is doing candid photography. I'm going to do formal photography. That's essentially what it was. And I'm going to take portraits of people, and that's going to be the truth about the Haight-Ashbury. That's a fellow that was literally standing in front of that wall where he is now, and his hair was blowing. And I said, oh, there's a, there's a portrait. So I went over and asked him if I could take his picture, and I, I took it. <laughs> I wanted total depth of field, so I had to situate my camera so I could get it. So one issue was that the exposures were long, so people couldn't move, so they had to be still. <laughs> Well, there was a cafe on Haight Street that I used to go to, and I went in there one day, and this woman was there. And the Haight had been a black neighborhood before the hippies came along. And she was a leftover person, I'm sure, and she was attractive, and I asked her if I could take her portrait, and she said yes, and I took it, and I really didn't talk to her at all. They were on the steps, as were many people. And it was another instance where I said, oh, there's a group of people. I asked them if I could take their picture, and they said yes. And so, uh, take a breath, exhale, and I'm going to take the picture when you're uh, doing that. So I didn't organize it. I just, I always organized the frame of the camera, not the, not the circumstance. That was in the, in the Golden Gate Park. And I walked over there and I saw them and I asked them if I could take their picture and they said yes and I took it. It's really that simple. <laughs> Except I, they had to pose and they had to be still. But you can't look through a Hasselblad when it's making an exposure. It doesn't work that way. Well, you can look down or you can look at eye level, but when the shutter goes off, it goes black. And it doesn't come back <laughs> until you advance the film. Frank French was in the park leaning against a big tree and I saw him there and I went up and I said, can I take your picture? And he said, yes, and I took his picture. And he was 16 years old, I found that out. And he was the only person I met, uh, with one exception, who was born and raised in the Haight-Ashbury. So his family lived there. I've subsequently found out that he's a composer and quite well known, but I can't find him anywhere. He keeps a very low profile. That one's around the corner from Haight on, on a side street, and I, I forget which one it was. And he was standing there. I said, wait a minute, I want to take your picture. So that's, that's how that one happened. Everybody made a caption, but most of those people at the age of 18 or 20 had no verbal skills or expertise at all, and they didn't know what to say. So I couldn't use the captions. Sam was an interesting character, and that room of his was quite something because he painted patterns on the floor, and he uh, put all those posters up, and he would go out and pick up women and give them acid and bring them back to his room. <laughs> and I was next door. But um, he had, he was older. He was like in his late 20s. He was probably my age. He'd been a legislative aide for a California state senator. So he'd been in politics before he decided he was going to be a hippie. That's who he was. <laughs> ah, there was a commune. Uh, do we have the name of his street there, maybe, where, where it was? I would photograph somebody, and I said, do you know somebody else I could photograph? And they would either give me a dress or tell me where to go. So this was a commune I went to on Frederick Street, and he was one of the people in the commune. And it's interesting, there's a picture of a woman in a satin robe who was his roommate, which I don't say. He was from New York, and he was pretending. 
And I think it was his way to pick up young guys. Pretty sure. Oh, Rick Griffin was a poster artist, one of the most famous, and they did something called Zap Comics. That's in his studio, in his house. And he, that wasn't, wasn't in the hate. He didn't live in the hate. He's the only person in the book who didn't live in the hate. And I wanted to photograph him because he was a, a poster artist. So I got, I got all the poster artists. I took pictures of it, all of them. But this is the only one that ended up in the book. Well, I'm not sure where she got what she was wearing, but it was a typical thing that women wore, things they sewed by themselves. Uh, so that's a really simple pattern. It's just here, 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 and here. Or they wore long skirts. It was cobbled together outfits, absolutely. She lived a block from where I lived, and I went out one day, and I saw her carrying her baby. And I had this thing about young women had a lot of babies and no husbands and no means of support, so it became something I paid attention to. So she was one of those people. Every time I saw one, I would try to take a picture of them, thinking that it was a phenomenon that needed to be paid attention to. So young women with babies and no visible means of support was one of my subjects. Here's a draft dodger, but there's probably not much to say about that. I didn't talk to him. Right. <clears throat> and of course that was... And I didn't, I didn't take his real name or anything. I didn't want to get him in trouble. I was suspended between telling the truth and not wanting to, uh, to get anybody and to have any problems with their life. <laughs>